le cloud. Bonjour Thierry. Hello Thierry. Hello, hello Jean-Guy. Thank you so very much for joining us. You were supposed to give a, a keynote this week in London at the World Spa and Wellness Convention, and I'm so happy and honored that you accepted to take some time um, to join us for this online session. Thierry, you are the managing partner of the monthly barometer uh, that you run with your wife. It's a succinct predictive analysis provided to private investors, global CEOs, and some of the today's uh, some of today's most influential opinion and decision makers. So I'd like to have your opinion in this 20, 30 minute session that we have today about your view on the current situation of the COVID situation. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Guy. And it is me who is delighted and honored to address you, your group. And I hope it's uh, que partie remise for, for, for London that we'll be able to meet in person soon. Well, you know, the pandemic is a... Um, is inflicting a shock, um, an economic shock, leaving aside the humanitarian uh, toll at the moment, um, of uh, unprecedented uh, proportions. Uh, and it's happening um, within a framework of radical uncertainty. We, we don't know for how long this is going to last. There are many fundamental uncertainties regarding um, the reproduction rate, uh, the R0, the number of people infected by uh, any carrier of the virus. We don't know exactly what the uh, morbidity rate is. We don't know exactly what the lethality rate is. So there are still many fundamental uncertainties. And uh, to confront these uncertainties, it seems like at the moment, policymakers have no choice but to impose a very harsh um, lockdown, uh, confinement measures um, that differ across countries and cultures, uh, which is of course exactly exacting a very um, high cost um, on the global economy. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, it's very important to understand what's going on to um, remind ourselves what exponential growth means. Um, uh, at the moment, um, depending on the countries um, that are concerned, but at the moment, roughly, the pandemic is um, increasing by more than 30% um, uh, a day in terms of uh, infection cases, uh, as well as deaths, by the way, which means that it doubles pretty much every two days, two days and a bit, 2.2 days. Um, so to, at the moment, uh, this morning we had 430,000 cases around the world and 20,000 deaths, uh, a bit less, but roughly 20,000 deaths. If the current rate of progression is maintained, that is, if nothing is being done, the assumption is that until the inflection point is reached, these numbers will double every two, three days. So it means that by the end of the week, we'll have 40,000 deaths, Next week, we'll have 80,000 deaths. Um, mid of next week, we'll have 160,000 deaths, et cetera, et cetera. So it's critically important to understand that we're dealing with a, a virus that is growing uh, in terms of infection cases and deaths at an exponential rate. So everything from a policy perspective has to be done in order to flatten the curve of the progression so that health systems are not being overwhelmed with the pandemic and do everything that is possible in order to contain the progression of the disease. This is a conundrum that governments face at the moment. This is a, these, these are very scary numbers indeed with uh, the pandemic on a health crisis. What about the economic slowdown and possible economic recession we would be facing? Because with today's 20,000 deaths, and this is tragic, we are seeing hundreds of thousands of small businesses closing down, shutting down on the verge of bankruptcy. What is your take on the economic possible recession? Well, my take is the following. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a possible recession. We are already in recession. You know, that's my take. Of course, it's very hard to measure um, what a recession uh, can be at the moment because we are just in the midst of this uh, of this um, uh, tsunami that the um, pandemic 
is in terms of economic impact, uh, a recession technically is two quarters of negative GDP growth, um, where you can be absolutely certain that the Q2 uh, around the world would be negative um, because uh, the pandemic is alive in all the systemic, uh, systemically important countries, the US, of course, economies, the US, the EU, uh, Japan, uh, China um, seems to have been able to contain the epidemic, but it's restarting very slowly. So um, from an economic perspective, it's critical to understand that we are facing both a demand shock, uh, people cannot consume at the moment, and uh, uh, a supply shock um, that is affecting the way in which uh, the economy operates uh, because of the disruptions in terms of uh, global supply chains. Uh, so the, the shock is absolutely major. Um, it has no precedent um, in terms of our recorded economic history. It never happened ever uh, since um, you know, economic records um, exist since the beginning of the 18th century, that um, um, suddenly the whole global economy um, comes to a, a standstill. Um, of course, not the entire global economy, but um, many sectors are being impacted incredibly hard. Uh, you and I, of course, are familiar with um, you know, travel and tourism, uh, hospitality, retail. I mean, the, the hit inflicted uh, on these industries is absolutely major. And again, with no precedent in recent economic history. So we are de facto uh, in recession at the moment. And the question is, um, will government, um, through uh, very aggressive uh, monetary and fiscal policies, governments and central banks, will they succeed in preventing an economic depression? That's a big question mark at the moment. Thierry, what is for you the prospect of reopening in May or this summer? How does this prospect look and how do you think the third quarter of 2020 will look like? With okay. Well, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Randy, but I have no idea. And in fact, I have no idea, not because I'm lazy, but because we cannot know what's going to happen over the next few weeks. Um, I, I happen to be um, talking on a regular basis to, to see very senior policymakers, um, including some, some heads of state. Uh, nobody knows, nobody knows. At the moment, the assumption that is being made is that with a bit of luck, uh, through these very harsh containment measures, we hope over the next four, five, six weeks to contain the progression of the epidemic and possibly to reverse the progression of the epidemic, uh, as China did successfully in um, January and, and February, through extremely harsh measures that are unlikely to be replicated with uh, the same success in um, in, in non-autocratic um, societies. So at the moment uh, in Europe um, and in the US, the hope is that by the mid-May, maybe uh, yeah, early May, mid-May, um, the confinement measures would have proven to be effective and then we can uh, slowly um, restart um, to uh, function, um, not normally because there won't be any normal, everything will be different when this is behind us, but the economy starts operating again. Um, but, you know, it is a hope. Um, uh, it's not a, a strategy. It's based upon the belief that uh, the epidemic will be contained. When you talk to experts, epidemiologists, virologists, um, specialists in public health, um, you know, many people, um, many experts would venture that uh, it may be that uh, like uh, with the uh, Spanish flu in 1918, there'll be different waves. Yeah, there seems to be a seasonality effect attached to the um, uh, coronavirus. Um, it seems to be spreading less rapidly and with less severity in hot um, countries um, and in the humid climate. Um, so it might well be that uh, with the arrival of spring, um, uh, there is an inflection uh, reached uh, in terms of progression, and then uh, it will move to the southern hemisphere and will restart again in um, in September or October or November, uh, as the flu does. Um, so until we have a vaccine, which is 
very unlikely uh, in the next 12, 15 months. Uh, there'll be this huge cloud of fundamental uncertainty affecting decision makers and uh, um, the policy decisions that they have to make. Now that the world has hit pause and maybe stop, uh, I mean, the world, the earth is still turning and there is, a, a China is slowly recovering, Japan is recovering, uh, the US is not completely in lockdown, uh, but it is definitely a pause button that, that has been hit and hit very hard. When it will be time to press start again, do you feel uh, with what you've seen in people's consumption patterns, like after 9-11 or the, the 28-29 crisis, will people are likely to press play and spend in an hedonistic way, uh, go for, uh, for, for, again, back for spas, for fast consuming, um, uh, fast moving consumer goods, uh, or was it, was it going to be a reset that is going to be uh, uh, pushed uh, especially with the agenda of the climate situation and people already yeah. thinking and shifting. So play or reset? Well, it could be both. Um, I'm uh, absolutely convinced that the uh, pandemic, when it's over, will entail, will trigger a fundamental reset about everything in terms of economics, in terms of finance, in terms of uh, how we deal with the environment, in terms of tech, in terms of uh, societal issues. Um, it will, of course, impact some uh, industries in a very fundamental way. Um, you know, I can't imagine that, the, for example, the cruise industry will continue operating uh, as, it, as it has been doing for the past uh, few years. Um, you know, I think my, my industry, uh, I have a, an events business as well, uh, will be fundamentally affected by, uh, by this reset. So many, many things are going to change in a very fundamental manner, including uh, in our individual Lives, how we relate to other people, how we socialize, how we consume. So there'll be a reset. Now, uh, what will happen um, when uh, the pandemic is behind us, hopefully, uh, totally behind us, I mean, uh, and, um, and we, we press um, the switch? Uh, two things. Well, first of all, um, an economy um, does not function like that. You cannot uh, switch it on or switch it off uh, and then you know, immediately it starts operating again. Um, the best analogy to think about how the economy can start is to think about a nuclear plant. You know, when you close a nuclear plant and when you open, reopen a nuclear plant, it can take months. And the same happens with an economy. You know, an economy is something which is incredibly um, complex. It's a network with many different players. Um, uh, famously complex. Uh, so when you restart it, there are many bits and pieces that need to, to adjust, and, um, and this takes time, particularly in the context of hyper-globalization with this interconnectedness of supply chains, uh, about which now everybody is a bit um, um, concerned. You know, I think that what the pandemic has taught us is that uh, relying on just-in-time supply chains can be incredibly dangerous. They are very effective at delivering value, but like all very complex things are also incredibly fragile. So maybe globalization will go, uh, we, it will not stop. Of course, we can stop globalization, but it might go into reverse. Um, the other point, so it takes time to restart the economy, um, not just a few days or a few weeks, but months, uh, to restore it at full capacity. Secondly, um, I think that um, when we try to think about similar um, shocks, you know, we often refer to SARS 2003, to uh, S11 uh, in 2001, to um, the swine flu in 2009, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we are victims of a like the past fallacy, you know, this cognitive bias that uh, makes us um, uh, draw similitudes between past events and current events. Well, what's happening at the moment with uh, the coronavirus crisis is something of unprecedented proportions. You know, it's of a fundamental different order of magnitude than uh, SARS, for example. SARS in 2003 uh, was followed by a very sharp um, economic recovery, so-called V recovery, you know, immediately the animal spirit came back and, uh, and the hit to global growth was very, 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 very tiny. 
uh, in this particular case, we're talking of something totally different, uh, you know, a very different order of magnitude, uh, as I just said. So, um, you know, we, we can compare uh, the situation, um, similar exogenous shocks that happened in the past um, with what's happening today. It's going to be much, much, much bigger. And, and some industries, I think, will take a very long while before uh, recovering, because when you switch the bottom on again, it's not that we are going to travel um, to a um, distant resort five times more to compensate for the fact that we haven't traveled for two, three, four, five months. Uh, we're not going to go uh, 10 times more to the rest, to, to restaurants. Um, you know, it might be because so many people will have been hit so hard in terms of the loss of income and the jobs. It might be that um, uh, consumption resumes in a very, very slow fashion um, um, with um, consumers um, uh, favoring um, savings uh, because, because they need to, because they have to, because that's the only way to, um, to, to, make, to make a living. Um, so, you know, let's not, um, let's not fool ourselves. The, the recovery will take a lot of time and uh, some industries, particularly the travel and tourism industry, which represents you know, all in all roughly 10% of global employment and uh, uh, you know, in an enlarged fashion, probably you know, five to 10% of global GDP, depending on the countries, um, it's going to take a lot of time and it won't be the same as before. When, when we look at these numbers and they are scary numbers, and especially when you talk about exponential growth of the death toll and the number of cases. Uh, as we record today, you said the numbers are roughly 20,000, but they could double by the time of the, um, of the online uh, professional beauty week ends. Um, it, I, I want to look at other numbers that you mentioned a few years ago when we met and you said wellness should be compulsory. At yes. the time, you were mentioning. Well, I don't, I don't say, uh, Jogi, Jogi, if I may, I didn't say it should be. I say it will be. It's not it my is. wish that when it becomes compulsory and imposed upon all of us, it has to be a choice. But I think it will be compulsory because um, because governments have no other choice um, in order to um, to, to to decrease um, you know health costs, etc. Yes, because at the time you were mentioning about 300,000 deaths due to obesity only each yeah. year and yeah. 35 million deaths each year due to the non-communicable diseases, which are cancer, yeah. strokes, heart disease, respiratory disease, diabetes, type two. I made the calculation, 35 million people dying prematurely every year out of 7 mm. billion from NCDs is about one person dying every 0 0.9 seconds because yeah. of poor choices in health. So yes. is this, through this challenge, an opportunity for the wellness industry, the spas, the salons that could focus on boosting the immune system? Well, I'd like to make two points. Uh, first of all, I think that what's happening at the moment with the um, pandemic is, um, you know, is in the long term, at the moment, it's very bearish for the industry, of course, because, uh, because there is no demand. But I think medium and long term, it's very bullish because when we are hit by something very big, uh, you know, an existential threat, that, uh, it's not threatening humanity, but you know, a big, big shock imposed upon all of us. Um, uh, it favors um, um, attention and um, uh, it makes us probably ponder what is important in our lives. And um, uh, I think after the pandemic, many of us will um, realize that uh, maybe the way uh, forward is not uh, consuming like nuts as much as we can, but uh, to take greater care of ourselves, to have a more fulfilling life. Um, to be more attuned to the needs of others, etc. So it's just you know, a, a supposition. I'm not saying it's going to be like that, but maybe the attitudes will change. And certainly what will change is a realization that we need to be uh, in better shape. You know, uh, of course, um, 
you cannot say that Trump had done too much during the time of the epidemic, but wellness helps to be um, uh, more um, resistant to diseases. It improves our uh, immune system if we do it well. Um, so I think all this is going to percolate, and uh, after the crisis, uh, everybody will um, will realize that um, wellness has to be the um, you know the, the driving um, parameter in terms of how we lead our lives. Um, I hope I hope it will be like that. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of death, um, uh, of course you are absolutely right. There are many deaths that occur. Most deaths, in fact, occur because of the poor choices we make. As human beings, we are very, very bad at making the right decisions for ourselves. Um, but uh, the pandemic cannot be... Um, um, it's a false equivalence to say that um, you know, pandemic uh, is going to be less important than the cases of heart diseases or um, uh, obesity, death, etc. Uh, I want to, you know, I'm, when you sent me the, the email this morning, I looked at the uh, numbers in the US. Um, so official numbers from the CDC. So in the US, the greatest cause of death is at the moment uh, heart disease, 655,000 deaths per year, followed by cancer, 600,000 deaths per year. And then you are, um, you know, weird things, car crashes, 42,000. We don't know yet how we will die. And these are, not in, if, if I may say so, um, you know, in a very uh, normal death, are part of the uh, economic factor of the West. We know that they're going to happen. They are not an exogenous shock inflicted upon the country. Um, and and basis, um, you know, fall crashes. Uh, to, to try to. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost uh, Thierry uh, due to maybe a saturation of the, of the bandwidth. Maybe there are too many people watching Netflix at that time or too many kids uh, homeschooled and, and taking their classes online. Um, Thierry is back. Thierry, you're oh. back. Thank you so very much. I think we have a few more minutes uh, be before maybe the... the um, the signal of the Wi-Fi is saturated. I, I'd like to ask you one last question, if that's okay, because anyway, yeah. we're reaching the end of oh. our session. With all the CEOs, yeah. the influencers you are daily in contact with, what are they doing I'm right going to now? The video because I can't hear you. Yeah. Thierry, can you can you hear me? Just about. I removed okay. the video. I can just hear what you're saying. Yes. I'm, I'm switching off my video too. With all the CEOs that you are in contact with and, and major influencers, what are they doing now to cope with the situation? And this will be my last question. And how could this inspire the spa owners and the spa managers who are listening to us today? How can we cope? What can we do today? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jean-Guy, can you hear me? Absolutely. Good, good, good. Um, well, I'm just going to repeat um, what, um, what I've been hearing from a few um, uh, you know, global CEOs. Uh, I think they're spending, all of them are spending 20 hours a day uh, on the phone with, uh, and, and on Zoom and uh, um, trying to, 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 to sort out the impact that this is going to have on the business um, and communicating with the teams. The, the lessons I can um, apply from my conversations with them and um, in terms of differentiating those who are successful, who seem to be uh, successful from the others, is, is four things, or oh, three things, three things mainly. First of all, um, communicating clearly with your colleagues is absolutely key. You know, the current situation is tremendously uncertain 
And the, the only way to assuage the, the anxiety provoked by uncertainty is for each um, executive, uh, CEO, person in charge of um, you know, other colleagues or, or teams to communicating very clearly about what's happening in the company and uh, what, is, um, what is going to happen to, to particular uh, employees uh, in terms of possible layoffs or losses of income, et cetera. That's absolutely key. Second thing is to show uh, empathy. Um, yeah, uh, it, it strikes me um, that uh, some companies are walking um, the, the talk at the moment. Uh, you know, some companies uh, where you take a very much producing for free uh, hand sanitizers, while uh, other companies um, like EasyJet uh, are, are deciding to go ahead with the uh, dividend payments to the, to the shareholders while um, you know, laying off uh, employees, which I find unconscionable. So uh, you know, showing empathy is absolutely key, particularly in terms of the image you may project um, in, in terms of your brand um, to the markets uh, after the crisis is, is over. And the third uh, element, which I think is essential, is to, to have a plan uh, based on different scenarios. Uh, you know, as I said, I use the term so many times, there were in a situation of radical uncertainty. Uh, so in such situations, the only thing that you can do is to have scenarios about possible um, outcomes. Um, so having a plan for uh, each and every one of them is, is key um, to have some uh, you know, idea of what the post pandemic situation is going to be in, for your business. Thank you, Thierry. One of the examples that I've, that I've seen uh, recently, and that was last week, about communicating clearly, it's something that uh, spa owners and managers can watch online. It is available on Facebook and I believe on YouTube also. It's Mr. Arne's Soreson um, address to yes. the, 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 his, his colleagues uh, all over the world uh, for Marriott. He mentioned that after 9-11, and after the 2008-9 crisis, the occupancy worldwide for hotels of Marriott uh, Group dropped about 20-25%. Since the coronavirus in, um, in, in, uh, in January, December, January uh, in uh, China, it dropped 80 to 100%. Some hotels are closing, Lots of hotels have already closed and some hotels do not know if they will reopen again. This is something he said very, very clearly. He did mention empathy and sticking together and, uh, and it's really, really important. And I really like your idea of not just having one scenario, but several. And it reminds me of a saying that goes, um, you should have as many plans as there are letters in the alphabet. If plan A doesn't work, you have plan B, you have plan C, you have plan D, <laughs> and so on. Yes, absolutely. So on. absolutely. Thank you so very much for your time. Is there, is there a final word, final conclusion, at least of hope that you, could, um, that you could share with the people listening today, and then we will close? Yeah, well, I'm full of hope because um, extreme events uh, force us to be very imaginative, uh, adaptive, resilient, and uh, we always understand underestimate the power of resiliency of the human kind uh, at our peril. You know, there have been uh, many more dramatic situations uh, in the past in terms of wars, in terms of plagues, in terms of, uh, and uh, we'll rebound and hopefully um, tomorrow's world will be a better world, uh, more tuned to, to our needs. Indeed. The only hope uh, based on what you said is that um, as you are listening to, uh, to Thierry and his insights, um, please think of the many scenarios you can have in, in what you do, uh, knowing that the new normal will be very different, most likely to be very different from what we know so far. Uh, reopening with the same treatment menu, um, facials, massage, waxing, and promotions, discounts, will only destroy your profitability and may not help you with the credibility of a, a world that needs more um, stimulation and strengthening of the immune system. How can traditional Chinese medicine help? How can self um, 
uh, stimulation with uh, physical activity can help. Uh, detox flush probably will be very much in demand also. Mental health is definitely something that we should dig more in. It could definitely be the topic of another, uh, of another session. Um, stay tuned for more. Thank you for your time, Thierry, today. Thank you. And Thank the, you so much, Johnny. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And there will be the details for people to continue to follow you and to subscribe to the monthly barometer. Thank you so very much for your insights and for the resource you are and for the inspiration. Bye-bye, Thierry. Bye-bye, everyone.